House Made of Dawn is a 1968 novel by Anne Scott Momaday, widely credited as leading the way for the breakthrough of Native American literature into the mainstream. It was awarded the Pulitzer Prize for Fiction in 1969, and has also been noted for its significance in Native American anthropology. With 198 pages, House Made of Dawn was conceived first as a series of poems, and then replanned as stories, and finally shaped into a novel. It is based largely on Mamaday's first-hand knowledge of life at Jaime's Pueblo. Like the novel's protagonist, Abel, Mamaday lived both inside and outside of mainstream society, growing up on reservations and later attending school and teaching at major universities. In the novel Mamaday combines his personal experiences with his imagination, something his father, Al Mamaday, and his mother taught him to do, according to his memoir The Names. Details in the novel correspond to real-life occurrences. Mamaday refers in his memoir The Names to an incident that took place at Jaime's on which he based the murder in Housemaid of Dawn. A native resident killed a New Mexico state trooper, and the incident created great controversy. Native American beliefs and customs, actual geographical locations, and realistic events also inspired elements in Housemaid of Dawn. According to one of Mamaday's letters, Abel is a composite of the boys I knew at Jaime's. I wanted to say something about them. An appalling number of them are dead, they died young, and they died violent deaths. One of them was drunk and run over. Another was drunk and froze to death. He was the best runner I ever knew. One man was murdered, butchered by a kinsman under a telegraph pole just east of San Isidro. And yet another committed suicide. A good many who have survived this long are living under the relocation program in Los Angeles, Chicago, Detroit, etc. They're a sad lot of people. In 1972, an independent feature film based on House Made of Dawn by Richardson Morse was released. Mamaday and Morse wrote the script. Larry Littlebird starred, considered a classic, NMAI went to great efforts to preserve the film, now housing all film elements in its film and media archives, which provide study copies. Summary Part 1. The Long Hair House made of Don Beggins with the protagonist, Abel, returning to his reservation in New Mexico after fighting in World War II. The war has left him emotionally devastated and he arrives too drunk to recognize his grandfather, Francisco. Now an old man with a lame leg, Francisco had earlier been a respected hunter and participant in the village's religious ceremonies. He raised Abel after the death of Abel's mother and older brother, Vidal. Francisco instilled in Abel a sense of native traditions and values. But the war and other events severed Abel's connections to that world of spiritual and physical wholeness and connectedness to the land and its people, a world known as a house made of dawn. After arriving in the village, Abel attains a job through Father Olgin chopping wood for Angela Street. John, a rich white woman who is visiting the area to bathe in the mineral waters. Angela seduces Abel to distract herself from her own unhappiness, but also because she senses an animal-like quality in Abel. She promises to help him leave the reservation to find better means of employment. Possibly as a result of this affair, Abel realizes that his return to the reservation has been unsuccessful. He no longer feels at home and he is confused. His turmoil becomes clearer when he is beaten in a game of horsemanship by a local albino Indian named Juan Reyes, described as, the white man. Deciding Juan is a witch, Abel stabs him to death outside of a bar. Abel is then found guilty of murder and sent to jail. Part 2. The Priest of the Sun Part 2 takes place in Los Angeles, California six and a half years later. Abel has been released from prison and unites with a local group of Indians. The leader of the group, Reverend John Big Bluff Tosama, priest of the sun, teases Abel as a long hair, who is unable to assimilate to the demands of the modern world. However, Abel befriends a man named Ben Benali from a reservation in New Mexico and develops an intimate relationship with Millie, a kind, blonde social worker. However, his overall situation has not improved and Abel ends up drunk on the beach with his hands, head, and upper body beaten and broken. Memories run through his mind of the reservation, the war, jail, and Millie. 
Abel eventually finds the strength to pick himself up and he stumbles across town to the apartment he shares with Ben. Part 3. The Night Chanter Ben puts Abel on a train back to the reservation and narrates what has happened to Abel in Los Angeles. Life had not been easy for Abel in the city. First, he was ridiculed by Reverend Tosama during a poker game with the Indian group. Abel is too drunk to fight back. He remains drunk for the next two days and misses work. When he returns to his job, the boss harasses him and Abel quits. A downward spiral begins and Abel continues to get drunk every day, borrow money from Ben and Millie, and lays around the apartment. Fed up with Abel's behavior, Ben throws him out of the apartment. Abel then seeks revenge on Martinez, a corrupt policeman who robbed Ben one night and hit Abel across the knuckles with his big stick. Abel finds Martinez and is almost beaten to death. While Abel is in the hospital recovering, Ben calls Angela who visits him and revives his spirit, just as he helped revive her spirit years ago, by reciting a story about a bear and a maiden which incidentally matches an old Navajo myth. Part 4. The Dawn Runner Abel returns to the reservation in New Mexico to take care of his grandfather, who is dying. His grandfather tells him the stories from his youth and stresses the importance of staying connected to his people's traditions. When the time comes, Abel dresses his grandfather for burial and smears his own body with ashes. As the dawn breaks, Abel begins to run. He is participating in a ritual his grandfather told him about, the race of the dead. As he runs, Abel begins to sing for himself and Francisco. He is coming back to his people and his place in the world. House Made of Dawn produced no extensive commentary when it was first published, perhaps, as William James Smith mused in a review of the work in Commonwealth LXXXVIII, the 20th of September 1968 because, it seems slightly un-American to criticize an American Indian's novel, and its subject matter and theme did not seem to conform to the prescription above. Early reviewers such as Marshall Sprague in his Anglos and Indians, New York Times Book Review, the 9th of June 1968 complained that the novel contained plenty of haze, but suggested that perhaps this was inevitable in rendering the mysteries of cultures different from our own, and then goes on to describe this as one reason why the story rings so true. Sprague also discussed the seeming contradiction of writing about a native oral culture, especially in English, the language of the so-called oppressor. He continues, the mysteries of cultures different from our own cannot be explained in a short novel, even by an artist as talented as Mr. Mamaday. 5. The many critics, such as Carol Olson in her, The Remembered Earth, Mamaday's House Made of Dawn, South Dakota Review 2, Spring 1973, who have given the novel extended analysis acknowledge that much more explanation is needed, before outsiders can fully appreciate all the subtleties of House Made of Dawn. Bain Kerr has elaborated this point to suggest that Mamaday has used the modern Anglo novel as a vehicle for a sacred text that in it he is attempting to transliterate Indian culture, myth, and sensibility into an alien art form without loss. However, some commentators have been more critical. In reviewing the disappointing Novel for Commonwealth, September 20, 1968, William James Smith chastised Mamaday for his mannered style. He writes in a lyric vein that borrows heavily from some of the slacker rhythms of the King James Bible. It makes you itch for a blue pencil to knock out all the intensified words that maintain the soporific flow, Link added. Other critics said it was nothing but an interesting variation of the old alienation theme, a social statement rather than a substantial artistic achievement, a memorable failure, a reflection, not a novel in the comprehensive sense of the word, with awkward dialogue and affected description, a batch of dazzling fragments. Overall, the book has come to be seen as a success. Sprague concluded in his article that the novel was superb, and Mamaday was widely praised for the novel's rich description of Indian life. Now there is a greater recognition of Mamaday's fictional art, and critics have come to recognize its unique achievement as a novel. Despite a qualified reception the novel had succeeded in making its impact even on earlier critics though they were not sure of their own responses. They found it.
A story of considerable power and beauty, strong and imaginative imagery, creating a world of wonder and exhilarating vastness. In more recent criticism there are signs of greater clarity of understanding of Mamaday's achievement. In his review, which appeared in Western American Literature 5, Spring 1970, John Z. Bennett had pointed out how through a remarkable synthesis of poetic mode and profound emotional and intellectual insight into the Indian's perturing human status, Mamaday's novel becomes at last the very act it is dramatizing, an artistic act, a creation hymn. Critic Kenneth Lincoln identified the Pulitzer for House Maid of Dawn as the moment that sparked the Native American Renaissance. Many major American Indian novelists, e.g. Paula Gunn Allen, Leslie Marmon Silko, Gerald Weisner, James Welch, Sherman Alexi and Louise Erdrich, have cited the novel as a significant inspiration for their own work. The Expression of Native American Culture Through Storytelling Many historical and cultural stories are told by the different priests in House Maid of Dawn. The character of the Priest of the Sun sermonizes many of the Kiowa legends Mamaday has addressed in his other works, such as The Way to Rainy Mountain. Mamaday had learned these stories as a child, and in this novel the method of transmission is the same, orally, though now in the context of a sermon. Similarly, the Priest of the Sun had learned the stories from his grandmother, who was, a storyteller, she knew her way around words. She never learned to read or write. The priest of the sun goes on to say that the difference in language between the two cultures, Native American and the, white man's world, is the value placed in words. In the white man's world there are words by the millions, on pamphlets, papers, receipts, advertising, and so on. For his grandmother, on the other hand, the word was a sacred object, attached to a story close to her thoughts and her experience. Words could never be sold, and she would never throw her words away. In this context of the sacredness of just a few meaningful words, Abel's mysterious reserve and quietness make sense. The Tempoof Life In the third section, The Night Chanter, Ben Benali dwells on the conflict between the pace of life in a more rural setting of the reservation, such as Wallatawa or the wild ruins where he grew up, and city life as a factory worker in Los Angeles. Life in LA is, all around you and you can't get a hold of it because it's going on too fast. There is no such thing as taking it easy or having a festival day in Los Angeles, the only way of life is working 12 hours a day and then going straight to the bar and drinking to unwind. The aim of all this work is to get a piece of something, a house, a car, anything. Back at home on the reservation, however, a completely different pace and set of goals dominates. When Abel cuts wood in the novel's opening section, he takes his time, coming back three days later to finish his job. On the reservation, however, that is accepted, as there is a feast and ceremonies that take precedence in the meantime. Material goods, which take such precedence in the modern society of L.A., can be traded for or worked out in different transactions on the reservation. Whereas Ben is able to reconcile these two vastly different paces of lifestyle in the city and reservation, he sees that Abel is unwilling or unable to do so, and likely never will. Historical and Personal Relationships with Nature When Francisco listens to the fields and sounds around him, what he hears often foreshadows an event relating to Abel. When Abel comes into town Francisco hears the low whine of the tires coming through the fields to the wagon road. Likewise, several nights before Abel's murder of the albino Francisco hears, whispers rising up among the rows of corn, and cannot put his finger on what the whispers mean until later, when he becomes conscious of an alien presence close at hand. Three days later, a sequence of events play themselves out, resulting in the death of the albino and Abel's arrest, and Francisco realizes, also out among nature in the fields, that he is alone again. The P-O-W-E-R-O-F-S-T-O-R-I-E-S In House Maid of Dawn, stories are important vessels of cultural preservation. Whether told by a grandfather to his grandsons, through the medium of dance at a traditional ceremony, or through a religious sermon, these folk tales pass on knowledge, worldviews, and beliefs from a seemingly bygone age. 
With the indigenous American population in North America greatly diminished and many of the tribes driven from their ancestral homelands, these stories help indigenous people preserve their culture and pass it along to the next generation. The descriptive texts of the stories provide insight into a worldview. The stories that Abel's grandfather told him, for example, define the intricacies and nuances of humanity's relationship with nature. In Tosama's sermons, his stories provide insight into the collapse of the indigenous American world and provide advice on how to navigate a modern American culture that is seemingly hostile to traditional beliefs. In the modern America that the novel depicts, people have a dramatically different relationship to the world around them than that depicted in the stories. While not everyone lives according to the worldview that the stories convey, they're powerful indicators of a world that once was and could be again. Throughout the novel, a clear contrast emerges between the stories of the indigenous people and the same stories told by Americans who descended from European colonizers.